How many of you are dog people? Show of hands. Excellent. How about cat people? Okay, you guys can go to the break early. <laughs> okay, so of the dog people and the cat people who want to be dog people, <laughs> how many of you have thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to know what my dog is thinking? And I think everyone else already knows what their dog is thinking, right? <laughs> well, I got into this project, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I this is basically a, a stupid dog trick story. Um, it really started with this dog named Newton, who was really my favorite dog. I've had many dogs through my life, uh, but Newton was my favorite, and he lived to be about 15 years old. And after he passed away, I thought, you know, I have these tools, this MRI machine that I've been using for decades to study human decision making and what motivates people. Why haven't we used this on other animals? Certainly other animals have many of the same feelings and motivations that people do. But this is kind of an area of science that people don't like to talk about. And so I embarked on this project about four years ago to try to figure out what dogs think and specifically what dogs think of us. Now, if we're talking about humans, we have kind of two ways we can think about uh, what other people are thinking. We can either ask them, and sometimes they will tell us if they know and, uh, and they want us to know what they're thinking, or we can observe actions, and we can observe behaviors, and we can try to infer things about what people are thinking from their actions. With animals, and dogs, of course, we can't really ask them. Well, we can ask them, and we may think that they tell us, but we really don't know what they're thinking, and so we're, we're kind of left with their behaviors. We can observe their actions, and we can try to infer what they're thinking. Now, this is, this is the foundation of behaviorism, and it's been around since Pavlov. But there are, of course, very tricky issues here, and humans being humans, we tend to anthropomorphize everything. So it's kind of in this area that I became very interested and intrigued with the possibility of trying to figure out what dogs are thinking by using MRI. And the technique is straightforward. It's been around for decades. And the idea is if we were studying a human, we would put a human in an MRI, have them do some type of task, and we'd measure blood flow or brain activity, and then try to figure out what parts of the brain do what. Very straightforward. If you've had an MRI, it's not terribly pleasant, but people will do it. So how do we do this with other animals? How do we do it with a dog? Well, I'm going to show you, and then I'll show you what we found. So here's a short video. It's a, what we call our training video, and it demonstrates how we did this. Now, before I start it, you're going to see two dogs in this video. The first dog, Callie, is my dog. She was actually the replacement for Newton, and she was adopted here in Atlanta from the Humane Society, and we, we loved Newton so much we could never get another pug, so Callie is the anti-pug, you'll see. Uh, the other dog you'll see is Mackenzie, a border collie, and we'll just kind of get right into it, and I'll narrate as we go along. So this is Mark Spivak. He's my partner in this endeavor. He's a dog trainer, and the first thing that we had to do is figure out how do we get dogs to go into a tube, around, put a head coil around their head to pick up the brain waves, and hold absolutely still. And what you're seeing here is Callie is not a particularly obedient dog. She has no particularly uh, uh, special skills. And, but she does have one very good trait, and that is she likes hot dogs. Now, Mark is doing what we call clicker training. So every time she approximates what we want her to do, he clicks, ah. and then she gets a hot dog. Now, this is the very first time Excellent. she's been introduced to the thing we call the head coil. And so we didn't know at this point whether this was even going to be possible. This dog, Mackenzie, a border collie, is highly trained. Uh, she's very skilled in agility, and her owner, as you'll see, gets her to sit in this coil very quickly. Good girl. Lots. Yes. Is she too far up now? Yeah, basically we're looking for, for the, brain, the brain thing, yes. to, the brain case to be in the center of, of it. 
Right there. Okay. That's good. So if, if, if you've had an MRI, you know that you're told not to move, right? And this is, this is the big challenge of doing this. And up until this point, I didn't know if this was going to be possible until I saw this. And this was literally after about five minutes of training. When I saw that, I knew we could do this. So what you saw McKinsey doing was close, but not quite good enough. Touch. What we're going after, if we're to achieve data that uh, compares to humans, You are is perfect, excellent, yeah. perfect job. Uh, Mark told me Touch. I had to be uh, more demonstrative than I am normally. <laughs> perfect, yes. So what you notice we did w was we introduced a little chin rest because we have to give the dogs a target to put their, their head on. And Mackenzie adapts to this very quickly. And she's in, actually, you can tell she's actually in a simulator now for an MRI that we built. And she's doing quite well, but this is actually still too much movement. The really difficult part of this is the noise that a scanner makes. And you can hear this playing in the background. These are recordings that we made to acclimate the dogs to the training. It's very loud. This is being played at low volume just to get her used to it. But it's really about 95 decibels. It's like jackhammer loud. So this is after about a month or two of training. And we're at the real MRI now. And this is probably the most expensive training session ever performed. We, we, the, we get charged about $500 an hour to use the MRI. And but we had to use the real thing at a certain point. At this point, we didn't even know how they would react to the magnetic field. And the, the key thing I want you to, to notice is that these dogs are doing it willingly, and they enjoy it. And that is the whole point of this project. Excellent. We, we treat these animals as family members. We don't sedate them, and we don't restrain them. And so this is actually after about two months of training. We have made some modifications to the chin rest, and even a shelter dog like Callie can do this. If, if you look carefully, you also notice that she's wearing earmuffs. So <laughs> it's very important because the scanner is so loud and the dog's hearing is, is quite sensitive. So the other thing that we did <laughs> this is a scientific experiment, really. So that's the training video. And the hot dog, no hot dog hand signals, we, we started with this because we didn't know if this was going to work. And so we decided we needed to do something really simple. And this is just straight up Pavlovian conditioning where we taught the dogs two hand signals. This means hot dog, and this means no hot dog. So if this technique w works, what we should see is activity in the rewards parts of their brain, the reward system, to this hand signal, but not this signal. Um, now, I also uh, put up a, a slide here that once we started doing this, kind of word got out amongst the community here in Atlanta that, you know, we're doing this crazy dog scanning project and we're looking for volunteers, especially people who like to train dogs and have dogs that are very well behaved. That is still true. If you have a dog that can do this or you think can do this, talk to me because the project is still going on and it's gotten quite large. So. You've seen the, the kind of the preliminary videos. This is one of my favorite photos because it kind of captures, this is I think the first day we were actually doing scanning. It captures the human confusion here. You know, we're just <laughs> standing around trying to figure out how we're gonna do this. But, but Callie knows, she's been trying, she's been doing this for two months and so she's ready to go. And uh, the head wrap is just to keep the, the earplugs in place, the earmuffs. This is what it looks like from the other end, from the business end of the scanner. 
This is actually a dog named Zen. He's a uh, yellow lab golden retriever. And what we're studying initially is, like I said, just the reward system response. And very simply, we've got these two hand signals, and the idea is we compare the brain response to these two things. As I said, we have many dogs doing this now. It's not just shelter dogs. We have dogs uh, from uh, service dog organizations. We have shelter dogs, really all sorts of breeds. OK, so before I show you some of the results, I do want to say something about brain anatomy. Now, a dog brain, this slide is not to scale. A dog brain is probably about the size of a plum or a lemon, maybe depending on the size of the dog. It's not big. So even if you have a big dog, most of the head is muscle. So just kind of be aware of that. But I like putting up this slide because it, it shows the similarities of animal brains. And you can immediately make out kind of common structures. You can see uh, towards the right that kind of very uh, pretty structure is the cerebellum that controls uh, various types of motor movement. And then below that, there's the brain stem and really the parts of the brain that are different are what we call the cortex. And so that's the upper part, that's the, the folded part. And the big differences between dog and human have to do with the size of the cortex and how folded it is. What folding accomplishes is packing a lot more brain surface area into a, a specific volume. So generally speaking, the more folded a brain, the more surface area, the more brain power, if you will. So, there's lots of similarities and there's some differences. What I'm particularly interested in are the similarities because if we're to have a, a commonality of experience with dogs and other animals for that matter, we have to share the same or similar brain structures. Darwin said this 150 years ago. Okay, so what do the results look like? This is a very compact way of summarizing an experiment which I showed you where the dogs received two different hand signals, and we've averaged the results over, in this case, 12 dogs. I think, though, we've done this probably in over 20 dogs. And the orange areas show what parts of the brain are more active to this reward signal, this, this hot dog signal. Now, what I want to emphasize is the brain response is not directly to hot dogs. It's to the hand signal that means hot dogs. And you may think, well, that's not a, a big deal. It's still hot dogs, right? And it's no surprise that dogs like hot dogs. But it is a big deal because we train this signal. It's a symbolic representation of a hot dog that the dog has learned and has learned to recognize this meaning. And the particular parts of the brain that are being active are the reward system. Those kind of two hot spots, those, those uh, headlight type picture, that's in an area of the brain called the caudate nucleus, and it's the area of the brain that, that all mammals have, and it's the area that has the most dopamine receptors in the brain. It, it's kind of the key center that links reward and motivation with action. So normally when that's active in a human or really any other animal, it means that something important has happened and the animal needs to do something. In this case, it's quite simple because they will just eat the hot dogs. Well, so what? So we proved that dog brains like hot dogs. Well, that was just the beginning. And this uh, started about four years ago, and we've since gone on and done many other experiments. Uh, most of the dogs that you saw in these pictures are still working with us in the project. We've done things looking at how their, their olfaction or their sensory uh, system for smell works how they identify uh, different people and other dogs in their household by smell. And one of the things that we found, for example, is that this reward system, the same part of the brain, activates when the dogs smell a familiar human, even if the human's not there. And so it shows that dogs have representations of us, of our identities, that persist when we're not there. And so when people ask me, well, do dogs miss us when we're gone? I have to say yes, because we find evidence that they are remembering their humans, that they care about them, and that it's associated with these reward responses. Is it still just hot dogs? So 
To answer this question, one of the other things that we did was we actually repeated the experiment I showed you, where we showed the different hand signals. With one little twist, we manipulate who gives the signals. So does it matter if the dog's owner gives the signal, or whether a stranger comes in and gives the signal, or even whether a computer gives the signal? Because if you believe Pavlov and all the behaviorists who followed him, it really shouldn't matter because you know, any signal that indicates an upcoming food treat is all the same if animals are, and dogs are just kind of robots. But in fact, we did find a difference. And what's very interesting about it is that not all dogs are the same. So for example, my dog Callie had a much greater response in that part of the brain when a stranger gave the signals, or even a computer, as opposed to me. <laughs> um, other dogs in the project, some of the uh, golden retrievers in the labs you saw, kind of had the opposite pattern, where their owners had really elicited the strongest brain response. This is, this is very interesting, because what it does is it provides us with a neural biomarker of, of a dog's personality profile. And in fact, what we've done is we've spun off a new project, which we're very excited about. Uh, we've partnered with Canine Companions for Independence, which is the largest service dog training organization in, in the United States. Now, if you know anything about service dogs, they are incredibly difficult to train. It's very expensive, and there's a very low success rate. Roughly about 35% of dogs that enter these programs to train to be assistance dogs will succeed, and the other two-thirds end up being released and adopted to their puppy raisers. So we've partnered with CCI, and they are actually training their dogs to do the MRI procedure, and what we're going to do is try to predict which of those dogs will actually be good service dogs. And so I really love this project because it shows that even though we started this just as kind of my silly example of, of trying to understand what my dogs think and whether they love me, it's actually gotten much bigger. Dogs, dogs are special. They are the first domesticated animals. They have been with humans since humans have been humans. And so when we look at their brains, it's almost like we're looking back in time, and it's giving us a picture of how the dog-human bond formed. Thank you.